So I went to the Institute of the Institute for Journalism and Natural Resources a wildfire workshop and conference in Missoula, Montana, uh, about a month ago. Jenka generously let me take her spot <laughs> um, as a KBU reporter during the the conference, and um, was very thankful as an intern to get that experience. And I got to speak with a lot of journalists that are a lot more experienced than I am, and I learned a whole lot, and it was a lot of fun. So from that, I learned many things. I learned that wildfire is a natural part of our landscape. It's something that you, we can't really escape, but conditions over the last century of fire, of uh, forest management, have created kind of unnatural conditions for wildfire. And this has been exacerbated by global warming, which has created in the Northwest drier conditions, not all over the globe, but in the Northwest, it's created hotter and drier conditions. There's a growing urban wildlife interface so more people are living in areas that were previously uninhabited, and this is creating more interaction of wildfire and human communities. <laughs> I'm gonna first speak about kind of the general, oh, there we go. Um, the general, like, what to do like on the ground when you're reporting on wildfire. So through, throughout my presentation, I'm gonna talk about like trends in, in um, like areas that are affected by wildfire, like broadly like what's happening with it but first I'll talk about if you choose to go into these areas which are to report on the ground what to do to keep safe and also to keep other people safe so first of all like why do people even enter uh, these wildfire areas well if you're a journalist you could wait for the public information officer's statement at the end of each day but if you want to report on the latest happenings of the wildfire you can enter these areas and report um, if, if you take the risk. And as a member of the press, you actually have the legal right to enter wildfire areas if you have a press pass. A lot of times police don't know this, so they'll, turn, they'll try to turn you away. And one thing I learned was that instead of like trying to argue with a police officer to enter like this wildfire area, that's probably not gonna work in your favor. Just go to the next entry spot where it's like a designated entry. And yeah, so with your press pass, you are legally allowed to enter these areas. It's at your own risk, but it's part of your legal rights as a journalist. So yeah, so you might need a creative approach to get into these areas, but if you want to, usually you can. Always wear a hard hat. The biggest reasons that um, wildland firefighters um, will get injured or can die is falling debris and falling trees. So um, as journalists, you should I mean, you're entering an active wildfire area. Wear a hard hat, wear like fire resistant clothing. Um, one of the guys that spoke mentioned that his photographer, his shirt started catching on fire because he was wearing just like a, a regular cotton shirt and there were embers falling on it. Common sense stuff, but also maybe stuff that you wouldn't think of if you're heading in. Um, so yeah, wear fire um, resistant clothing, bring plenty of water in an ice chest, like plenty, plenty. Like an, if you're driving in with your own car, they recommended bringing like an entire cooler worth of water because you might encounter people that are injured too that may be really dehydrated. And finally, uh, as a journalist, they said one of the biggest mistakes that, uh, that's made is you head in with a phone and then you lose phone reception cuts out. Um, so one of the things that they recommended was using radios like have someone designated to, to like communicate with you. So maybe you're in danger or maybe they can update you with the latest, like what's going on. Um, that was one of the biggest things that was recommended is, is to ha don't rely on phone reception when you're in these areas. And if you do have reception, having someone back at like your station or whatever um, it is ha that you can communicate with is always a good idea. One of the really like complicated parts of reporting on wildfire is the journalistic ethics and how that that um, applies to this. So there's going to be animals that are injured. There's going to be people that are injured. It's, I guess, up to the journalist how much you react to that and like whether you might not have medical training. Do you engage with that? It's, these are things that are really complicated and people should really think about before they enter and not just like enter the area like kind of willy nilly. So that and um, if you go to shelters. To interview people, there are likely people that lost their houses or even lost their family members. So it's it's something that needs like tenderness and um, thoughtfulness. Um, 
Okay, so there's a lot of problems with reporting on wildfire that just come from just misconceptions. So here you see a burn severity map. So as you can see, there's a lot of variability in the, the burn. So there's a whole lot of diversity of burn. So a lot of times when people see this, they'll just assume that, oh, like my, ho my house is burned down or oh, my family member that was there like may have be severely injured or perished. It's not, it's not really not like that. And that can lead to a lot of um, confusion and general misunderstanding of how wildfire works. It's also dependent on fuels. An entire area isn't going to burn uniformly because there's going to be different fuel within that area. So there could be a parking lot or there could be a um, pile of leaves. These things are going to burn differently. Like it's not going to be a complete uniform area of burn. So many co like common descriptions in the media of wildfire is uh, it came through like a tsunami or it was uh, like a dragon coming down the hill. That's not how it works. It's it's fire and firebrands being thrown out ahead in the fire like slowly encroaching. It's, or it can be very fast, but it, it doesn't, it's not like a wall of fire coming down. That's never how wildfire works. So uh, what's the harm in, in misreporting this type of thing? Like, like what, what's really the harm in saying, in, sh in showing an entire red area versus a burn severity map or just maybe more description in um, context? Well, misunderstanding can lead to conspiracy theories. Here you can see buildings that are, have burned, but the trees around them are fine. The un all that undergrowth is fine. I mean, if you didn't understand how wildfire worked, if you think it just swept through, it would be hard to, ex I mean, I can understand it. It would be hard to explain why did this building burn completely while everything else around it is green and fine? Well, that's because we know that wildfire does not move in a, like in a, in a wall. It's propelled forward by firebrands. So most likely a firebrand up to a half mile away from the, the uh, wildfire was dropped onto these buildings, caught fire and burned them to the ground. The, they were more flammable than the trees around them. So they burned and the trees did not, it's varying fuels. So a conspiracy theory that um, people came up with to explain this was government lasers. So, they explain this, and this was really popular. It spread across Reddit um, and Facebook. Um, people believed that the government was shooting lasers down to these buildings and burning them, because why else was everything else not burned? Because as we know, uh, wildfires in a giant red area, okay? Everything there burns. Well, that's not how it works, and that's a way that misconceptions can lead to conspiracy theories is misunderstanding people trying to explain the, what they think is unexplainable. They come up with firefighters or um, uh, helicopters with lasers, which was not the case. <laughs> but I mean, it's people lost their homes. They didn't, they wanted to understand why this happened. Why did my home burn down, but my garden didn't burn? I mean, that it, I can understand that, but that's part of what, oh, go ahead, sorry. Did they say that uh, like television agencies shouldn't use those kind of red graphics with little flames on Yes, them? yes. So television agencies were a lot of times just I didn't put, I didn't even put up the craziest of them. This is what was normally um, posted. Some of them would have a moving fire graphic over an entire area, which is just, I mean, it, it, it just caused a lot of unnecessary panic. Go ahead. It also seems like when we see that kind of coverage like that with the big red area, it misleads the public about how wildfires happen. Mm -hmm. So in the future, when someone's getting one of these alerts, you know, you need to get out of your house. Yeah. People don't even know what to look for. Yeah. They don't even know how to take it seriously. I don't see a wall of flame, so I'm just going to keep watching. Oh, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because that's the wild wildfire is very serious in it. Um, I mean, as we found out last year, I mean, it, it can be deadly understanding exactly how it works can really like mitigate a lot of the like um, it, it can save lives it can it can encourage people to leave areas even if they think that the area is oh it's fine well yeah sure this is fine but maybe you're not gonna have a way out if, if it all turns to like um if if the fuel is right and, and the fire can um, take hold around your house it's not so what can you do basically so 
there's a lot um, you can do to fireproof your home. So this home, for example, there's a zone around it that's fire resistant, so that's gravel. Maybe if you had a pile of leaves there, it would be a different story if fire um, approaches the house. So um, create zones of fire resistance. Plastic overhangs are one of the most dangerous things to have in your house during wildfire because if, they, if there's uh, leaves or anything in there, the leaves catch fire, the plastic melts, and it starts dripping onto whatever's below. And you better hope it's not a propane tank or a pile of leaves or whatever. I mean, it, that's really important. So that's the next thing is um, firewood stacks and propane tanks should not be located in this zone. So like say you do have plastic siding over here or um, a plastic ring gutter or whatever the case, if you have this zone concept applied to your, around your property, so like gravel, even with that, it's still less likely to catch on fire because that dripping, um, those embers aren't going to have anything to um, ignite on. Um, so also a double paned or um, tempered glass is a big thing because a lot of times if it's a single paint, it'll um, shatter. Um, and oh, vents. So that's a huge way. That, so that's one of the main reasons houses will catch fire is um, fire brands or the embers that are shot forward, like up to a half mile forward uh, in front of the wildfire can enter these vents and catch fire within the house. So even if your house is, is like the siding cement or stucco or um, metal, what have you, like these things that um, are fire resistant materials that you can um, build your house with, it doesn't matter if you don't have great events that will stop um, uh, fire brands from entering your house. So if you're, the outside of your house is cement, but your attic is made of wood, then it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, but there, I mean, this is easy to say. It's, it's a lot harder to implement. Um, there are like economic barriers. So not everyone has the money to create a fire safe house. Like community, like communities that live in trailers, they, they don't, ha there's no way that this can be applied to a trailer. So there's a lot of complications that go into, it isn't just, oh, being ready, fire ready. Um, there's a lot of Sadly, there's there's a lot of barriers to having a fire resistant home. So only certain portions of our population can, honestly. Um, but so okay, I'm gonna try to try to play this video, but uh, we will see what happens. Fire suppression. So this is a Smokey the Bear commercial from, I believe, the '60s. So I'm gonna play it. We'll, we'll see how this works. Okay. Okay, so that was basically the public um, uh, information campaign that was waged for about a century. Um, fires are, wildfires are bad, they must be suppressed at any cost. Um, and, oh wait, what did I just do? <laughs> One second. Um, um, so uh, just last year, I believe we had the 70th anniversary of Smokey the Bear. So Smokey the Bear was really the face of federal policy about wildfire, which is fire suppression at all costs. Um, so uh, fire is painted as a natural, um, it, almost like an evil, like supernatural entity that must be feared and hated, and under no cir circumstances can like be let. To, it can be let to um, take hold. He represented the the fire regime of the federal government, which was fire suppression. They had something called the 10 o'clock policy, 
which meant by 10 o'clock the next day uh, of whenever the fire ignited, the fire must be out. So that's very different a very different policy from what scientists now recommend, which is um, regular controlled burns. So wildfire is part of the landscape. Uh, so controlled burns or prescribed fires are needed um, to upkeep this landscape. And without fire, with 100 years of fire suppression, we have had a massive buildup of fuel in, in forests. So underbrush, dead trees, things that under other circumstances would have burned, but now it's it's all um, it's sitting in our forest, and it, it it's it's total suppression has led to massive catastrophic wildfire, and it didn't come out of nowhere. There were deadly fires that that raged at the um, in the at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. There were huge uh, wildfires that uh, waged, and many lives were lost. Um, so it was kind of this um, almost a knee-jerk response to um, wildfire, which has always been part of the landscape. Um, and it also kind of dovetailed with the conservationist movement. After European uh, colonization, there was environmental devastation in, in large parts of North America. And in response to that, there was this con growing conservationist movement. So Not the ones like the Chicago fire and... Like, was it the 1900 or the 1890s because of all of the deforestation that had been done like, throughout Illinois and that led to, like, the brush that was... Yeah, so, um, part, so now we're dealing with massive fuel buildup, but at the turn of the century, they were also dealing with um, massive logging operations, which I'll go into a little bit um, later. Massive logging businesses that were going through and... Um, logging the indigenous trees and this allowed uh, uh, underbrush and um, uh, non-native trees to take hold which a lot of them were a lot more flammable than the natural trees like the ponderosa pine is naturally fire resistant but um, because of logging the douglas fir has been introduced in a lot of areas in the west where it wasn't um, naturally um, part of the landscape and it's a, it's incredibly flammable um, we were shown videos of a uh, douglas fir just it just goes up in flames like that. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about um, that, that later on. But uh, so yeah, so there's this massive um, fuel buildup under the Smokey the Bear um, policy. So there's a little, I just wanted to add that in. <laughs> there's a little um, bear cub that was rescued um, by a wildland firefighter. Um, but okay, so who's missing out when we talk about fire suppression. So this was the landscape in 1933. Um, this is Mount Hood. Um, and here's the landscape in, uh, I believe, 20, 2015, yes. In, in many areas of the world, logging has decimated forests. But in this particular case, the forest is actually encroached in areas in the environment that um, it actually it did not um, have a hold or, before. So this can, for example, wetlands. Um, when forests enter wetlands, forests that would naturally burn um, enter wetlands, the trees soak up a lot of the, the water that um, makes up the wetlands and that can lead to actually drought in these areas. And the entire ecosystem that relies on this, the wetness of the wetlands um, can face a lot more challenges than they did before. So here you can see it, um, the landscape after a fire it, there's still remaining forest, but it's patches of the forest that have burned. That's what is typical. So without this, uh, deadwood eating insects and their predators, for example, um, like a woodpecker, they don't have their natural ecosystem to rely upon. Animals like the lynx that rely on young forests for their hunting ground for visibility, they can't. They, they have challenges to hunting in a, a thickly populated forest like this. And salmon actually are um, affected. So been, studies have shown that wildfire smoke can actually cool down rivers where salmon are um, populated. And it can, I mean, there's um, also uh, chemicals that can be introduced. So there's varying, there's varying effects. But that is one positive effect that um, salmon can have cooler um, temperatures to, to live in, which, as I'm sure you guys know, is, can be life-saving for them sometimes. So without that, the, they have no cover, the, the smoke that's there that could um, blanket 
the river um, between like the sun rays is never, it's, it's not here. There's some parts of the forest that haven't burned in a century, which usually forests, it, I, I believe it was every 20 years of for, um, wildfires usually introduced naturally. But there's, I mean, many parts of the country where it, it's been a century without fire. And herbivores, so uh, moose to mice, so um, areas where it was um, more like grassland or prairie, where forest is kind of encroached, they have less area to graze, they have less insects that rely on that type of ecosystem um, to eat. So it really affects, like the list goes on. These are just a few main ones. It affects the entire ecosystem. So federal policy on this. So um, money, more money is needed as um, climate change progresses. <laughs> Our forests, as particularly in the, the Northwest, are getting drier. There's more instances of ignition so there's actually there's a lot more funding that's that's um, needed for the the um, National Park Service and the Forest Service um, who uh, employ wildland fire firefighters in manage um, fire uh, or forest management policy. Um, but there's actually been a decline in their budget um, and also threats um, from uh, from our current administration Trump um, to cut further cut um, the the budget for um, fighting fire or managing forests, um, both. So um, one thing we learned was the Forest Service is actually seeking private investment in, in their projects because they're not getting investment from the government. So there, there was a program created to partner with um, companies like um, Nestle to invest in areas where they have buy-in um, a journalist rightly pointed out, well, aren't there some complications that can happen when, when Nestle, a, a, a private water company, becomes involved with national fire policy? So you can mull that one over. Um, the, the, there was a representative brought in to talk about it, and she said, oh, well, there's, like, there would be back um, stops, there would be no involvement, but this isn't how we should be funding our forest management at all. <laughs> it just adds in a lot more um, gray or the gray areas and um, less like understanding of where the money's going and why it's going there. So, what one journalist uh, mentioned: Well, what if there's a water source that Nestle wants to protect? Which is, I think, is the whole way this um, program is supposed to work: is they buy, it's um, creating buy-in for protection of these areas. But um, there's a community that also like needs um, forest management. So is it Nestle's water source going to be chosen over this community that's surrounded by forests that have lots of um, fuel loads and need to um, have thinning and um, in a prescribed burn zone? So that's something to be to thought about. <sighs> So the first prescribed burn was in 1976, um, but since then there's been uh, a really slow adoption of prescribed burning into federal policy. There are some ch challenges that are I don't have an answer for, and, and a lot of people that um, were speaking about this didn't have an answer for. For example, California, the wildland urban interface is basically marbled throughout the state. So like, how are you going to do a prescribed burn in an area that is populated? Um, not in one concentrated area, but dispersed everywhere. That's a, a big, a big question that um, hasn't been addressed yet. Can you just say something? Yeah. Have you ever heard of Judy Berry? Um, she was a forest activist. She oh, talked yeah. about the gentrification of the forest. That's exactly yeah. what she's talking about. That's so interesting. That's yeah. She used to put. She she was a carpenter who was putting redwood shingles on houses oh. in, that were like people's cabins, and that's where she got her like consciousness from. Like, Oh, that's so I, this interesting. Thank you. Anyway, wow. <laughs> um, oh no. Did, sorry, it just takes a minute. It, um, there we go. Okay. Um, so, um, and federal policy, when prescribed, burn, prescribed burns happen, there are multiple objectives. So it's not just like a fire doesn't burn uniformly their objectives with that fire aren't going to be uniform. Like there's different um, burn severity areas in a prescribed area. Um, they, there's some areas that it's going to be full suppression, um, keeping the fire line. There's some areas that they're going to just let burn naturally. So, um, and that depends on where 
people are living usually? That depends on where people are, are living. So if they're, so um, we were shown a, a map of a Northern Arizona and a prescribed burn. Um, and what, there was an entire area that was um, considered like good to burn. The conditions were good. Um, There's a huge fuel build up there that they knew that they need to, it was likely to burn in the next five years um, in a wildfire if they didn't do it in a controlled manner. And then there was one cabin in um, like the upper um, third of that area. So they had to shape their entire um, prescribed burn around this person's house. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> so all right, the question on everyone's mind. So um, climate change and mega wildfire. So um, like I said before, there's variations on how climate change affects um, the earth. So there's, it isn't, there isn't um, warming and drying happening everywhere. In some um, areas, it's actually getting wetter. But in the Northwest specifically, it is getting hotter and it's getting drier. And that's why we're a hot spot for um, wildfire and mega wildfire. So since 1979, the duration of the fire season has increased by 20% worldwide. So generally, it is getting hotter and drier. This isn't everywhere, but generally the world is getting hotter and drier, which is leading to more wildfires. So the global land area affected has also doubled, but region to region, the causes of wildfire and environmental trends vary. So um, in our area, temperatures are rising. Um, the snow melt is um, happening earlier and earlier in the year. And this drying effect dovetails with our fuel buildup. So it dries this fuel in the forest, basically, the fuel load, so the amount of material buildup in the forest, fallen trees, underbrush, this type of thing. Um, so it's further drying this fuel buildup in the forest that's occurred after a century of fire suppression. So we're a bit more at risk than other areas where fire suppression has not been exercised. It, it varies from region to region, but in our region, this, these two things have combined to form um, conditions for mega wildfire. So wildfires that are 100,000 um, acres or larger. And like I said earlier, a lot of areas have not burned in a century. So there's a lot of buildup and it's it's getting drier in our environment. So th that buildup is, is um, drying out. Um, so basically many factors have combined to create um, mega wildfire conditions in the West. Um, and we saw that last year. Um, it's like a, tin it's like a tinderbox and it's, it's dangerous. So fire is, wildfire is part of our landscape, but wildfires of this size, severity and frequency are not normal and they've resulted from man-made climate change and fire policy, so. A lot of subtle ways that uh, fire suppression affects the, the landscape. So I'm sure you guys have heard about the bark beetles that have flourished under fire suppression. <laughs> so 850 million acres of forest have been lost to bark beetles since 2000. And this affects all areas of the food chain. So grizzly bears have lost a major food source, um, pine cones, because of areas affected by bark beetles. So why have bark beetles ha taken hold under fire suppression? Well, trees, when they are affected by wildfire, they emit sap. So it's like a natural defense to fire sap is poisonous to bark beetles. So it's basically a, a tree's shield to bark beetles. They have less of an ability to scar the tree and ultimately kill the tree if, if there's sap on the outside of the tree. So it, it's uh, poisonous to them and it's just this natural barrier that has not occurred for a lot in a lot of trees because they haven't been exposed to fire. So this lack of fire exposure for many trees has created an environment where um, 850 million acres <laughs> have been affected by the bark beetle. Um, and this is just, it's, that's what the bark beetle naturally does. It, it's, it's just, it's, it's not the cause of this, we're the cause of this, <laughs> but um, yeah. So another part of this wildfire landscape is utility companies. So we now know the cause of the campfire 
last year, the deadliest fire in California history. 85 people died in the town of Paradise. The cause of this fire was sparks from power lines managed by PG&E, the utility company. So many ignitions are caused by sparks from power lines. So this is not the only cause of wildfires, but it's a significant um, cause and it's something that can be mitigated. So there's ways that they can mitigate these sparks, but there has to be buy-in from these companies and pg and is going bankrupt because of all the, the claims that people have made that have lost their homes because of this fire. Hopefully that will be enough buy-in for utility companies to take this seriously. Hopefully, I mean, one can only hope. Yeah, regular people pay the price of this fire. pg and is not paying people for the, 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 the damage to their homes. Um, 85 people died, people lost their parents, their siblings, their kids, their houses, their pets. I mean, pg and E. I mean, there's, they're up for, they're, some of the people involved with this are up for charges of involuntary manslaughter and murder, so. The fire resistant forest. So there's no way that we can man manage all of our forests in the United States. That's impossible, but we can manage parts of it. Maybe areas that are close to communities or areas that are especially vulnerable. Um, so there's kind of a combined strategy for creating a resilient and resistant forest. Either of these by themselves don't really work. The, the combined strategy is key, no matter what anyone says. Um, you can't just thin. You have to create prescribed burns. You have to manage your, um, the area. And prescribed burns, if a burn is planned, it can be planned under favorable wind conditions, favorable um, if they know that the rain's coming the next day. Okay, these are things that can make for a safe burn that otherwise, I mean, there's no way to predict when this stuff is gonna burn. It could burn when rain's a month off and you're in a drought. So this is a way that we can really um, have some control. It's, it's not, it's never, fire's never completely in your control, but there are, there are ways that we can um, put wildfire more in, in our control and create safer, uh, a safer environment for communities that may be in this wildland urban um, interface. Um, so um, yeah, so you can choose these conditions and then thinning. So it's uh, removing underbrush, it's taking out trees that may not be in indigenous to the area. So Douglas firs, uh, which you can see here, they have really encroached in areas of ponderosa pine that have been, so the ponderosa pine was largely logged in these areas. So it's allowed for um, uh, Douglas firs to grow up a lot of times right next to the ponderosa pine. So the ponderosa pine is fire resistant, but when a um, Douglas fir is growing next to it, maybe a fire is coming through like right here. If there's a Douglas fir right here, even if uh, the, res the fire resistance natural and in inherent in a ponderous pine, it's not enough if there's a torching tree right next to it on fire. It's like holding a flame to the, the tree instead of having fire come through. Like here, you can see the underbrush burning. Um, maybe there's moments when the fire reaches up and then goes back down. But when you have a Douglas fir right next to um, a ponderous pine, it's just consistent fire there and the, the pine will catch on fire. So this is combined strategies. So having a managed forest um, or having prescribed burns without um, instituting thinning can still create conditions where you'll lose more trees than you, sh than you should have. So these are things that um, go together. Well, uh, I, I think, I believe Trump um, tweeted something about raking the forest. Yeah. What I think he was talking about is thinning. But again, raking, thinning, whatever it is, alone is not going to do the trick. You have to combine these things. Um, to make a truly resilient force. I think forest. they wanted to just clear cut um, and then there wouldn't be fires, right? <sighs> yeah, we'll get to that one. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I think I'm really doing him a favor go, making a leap from raking to thinning. So I don't know if that's what he was talking about, but all right. So um, the 21st century wildland firefighter. So these are the people that are managing our forests. These are the people that are risking their lives um, in, to manage our forests. And they, have a, they face a lot of um, obstacles. So 
So PTSD is a really big problem for wildland firefighters, and because of this, um, suicide rates are much higher than the national average um, for wildland firefighters. And there's less people now interested in the job as well because of the danger and a lack of funding. There's, I, I believe it's the average pay is about $35,000. And these people are called up any time of night, whenever, for extended periods of time. There are other jobs you can do that are less dangerous and have more stability. And because of that, there's a um, waning amount of, of the American workforce that is interested in wildland firefighters as we need them the most. So wildland firefighters are, are needed if we're gonna manage our forests. There's always gonna be danger inherent, but if people could be paid for that, that for risking their lives in that way, maybe we'd have more people interested in the job in people who don't have to go, 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 go because there's a lack of an amount of employees that should, um, should be responding, uh, of amount of a wildland firefighters that should be um, able to respond. So there's a lot of um, sad and also beautiful stories that um, can be told from the sector. So. Okay, so it's a little political science major. This was maybe the most interesting part of the fire, but I'll keep it short. Um, so the politics of wildfire, um, where money is allocated, which in which states is money allocated. So there's federal policy and then there's also state policy and these things are enmeshed. So um, there, we don't have, there's no possible smoke free future, no matter what politicians will claim. Um, there's no way that we're gonna live in a future without wildfire. That can, that future can be very different depending on what policies we, we secure, but that, there's no way that we're gonna be completely without uh, wildfire. So this is kind of a bipartisan issue of um, misunderstanding wildfire, or at least misrepresenting the responses. So both Republicans and Democrats have been wary of um, embracing things that may scare away constituents like prescribed burns. I think Ron Wyden has, has um, come out, uh, he, won't, he hasn't taken a stance on it. He won't advocate for prescribed burns um, he will only advocate for um, um, for like um, fire response. So you see this um, plane dropping flame retardant, things like that that are neutral, but aren't. This is just a, a response. This is not um, something that's going to be able to mitigate fire, a wildfire in the long run. This is one way that we can fight fire as it happens, but it's not a, a policy change that's going to. Um, paint our future in, in either way. So, um, yeah, so a lot, there's been a lot of issues with restoration projects that maybe will employ uh, thinning and um, prescribed burns. There's a lot of issues with those projects getting funded because they're controversial for politicians. They don't want to tell their constituents that there's going to be a prescribed burn 10 miles from their house. People don't want to hear that and because they don't, they don't know what prescribed burns mean a lot of times. It, they don't understand that, th that this could save their house and their lives in the long term. So it's a, it's a hot potato for a lot of um, politicians that, and they're not willing, they're not willing to um, take, take up the issue. So um, scientifically backed projects, things that we need um, are not happening because there, there isn't enough political buy-in. So, okay. The logging industry. So, love it or hate it, it's, it has um, created the Northwest in many ways. Um, so it's decimated, decimated native trees. I mean, you can see here. I mean, this is a, in Northern California, actually, um, a giant redwood. But um, it's decimated indigenous tree populations. But a lot of people see it as a historic industry, they have uh, nostalgia for it. So when white settlers came in and created a lot of these towns, this was the inception of, the, of many towns was the logging industry. So there's a lot of people that kind of look back fondly on this era. <laughs> and they're often painted, um, like Trump painted, has painted the logging industry as a waiting savior that can save us from wildfire. Well, a lot of the underbrush and invasive trees that need to be cleared and burned, they're not profitable. 
it isn't realistic to say, oh, so the logging industry can come in and perhaps like thin. They can't make, there's no profit there. So even if they were allowed access to all these um, lands, which actually the logging industry, when they can work to thin, like work with um, these like uh, federal departments to, to thin areas that need to be thinned, that's happened before, but largely it's not an answer. Generally, the, the um, trees that need to be cleared or thinned um, are not profitable. So, but the twist is to thin these, these trees, maybe Douglas firs in Montana, you do need the infrastructure there to be able to process it. So that's kind of this catch 22 of the logging industry can't, there's no resurgence. It's not, it's just not going to happen. It's not realistic, but we do need to keep that infrastructure to process the thinned wood. So it's kind of this complicated issue. So, I mean, there, from what um, I was told, there's not, there isn't money in the budget, the already like kind of thinned budget to operate a mill. <laughs> so it's, it's a very complicated um, issue. But go ahead. Burn, but it was actually oh. started by a logging company. Really? It was so big um, that people speculated it was vis visible from space. And um, the King the, the King Gas Oregon History Podcast uh -huh. edition of the Till McBurn is absolutely worth listening to. Um, because this is Till McBurn. Yeah. It's definitely what I learned from, um the biggest takeaway was these things are very complicated. <laughs> um there there is no singular answer. Um and the answers themselves are complicated so yeah that's yeah all right so growing wildfire smoke inhalation as a public health crisis so there are many health problems associated with wildfire smoke um and there's populations that are especially vulnerable so there's low birth weight associated with wildfire smoke both the fetal mortality and the um one year and under um, mortality of, of babies rises in areas where there's wildfire smoke. For the children and um, elderly, respiratory problems are associated with this. Lung cancer is associated with wildfire smoke um, inhalation, like sustained. So you kind of have to think, what what's the escape? Like, how do you escape the smoke? There there has like there's air filters, yes, but many homes don't have. Just like the infrastructure of many homes isn't um, fire friendly many of them don't even have air filtration systems. So it's really hard to kind of give people reprieves from wildfire when they don't even have air circulating. It's just still air. The, when they open the door, the wildfire smoke comes in. When they close the door, it stays. Schools have these systems that are required by law, but most of the standards for um, filters, they're called um, HEPA filters, the standards for the filters are not, they're not high enough graded um, to handle wildfire smoke. It's like normal pollution, that type of thing or normal pollution, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but so while there's a filter there, the wildfire smoke's still entering these areas. So kids are sitting in classrooms with wildfire smoke just sitting in the air. Hospitals, I mean, these are areas where you don't want wildfire smoke. The, the air filters that are found in like public areas, public schools, um, hospitals, that type of thing, are just not graded high enough for wildfire smoke. So, um, and also, so there's also a whole community, the houseless community, is out in the open air. There's no filter between them and, and wildfire smoke. Um, so it's it's not as simple as closing your door and getting away. Um, so in, in Mongolia, uh, many cities have um, been, in schools they've been putting in big air pur purifiers, like two or three to a room in um, areas where children are to clean the air. And this is something that's also happening in Montana. So. In Missoula, there's a there's a um, initiative, I think, by the health department to put these um, air filtration systems, like heavy duty um, air filtration systems, that can be like upwards of a thousand dollars, in areas where children and elderly and the sick are. Those are the most vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable to wildfire, but or to wildfire smoke, but um, there are communities that are hit harder. So, yeah. Okay, so one of the big takeaways also was wildfire smoke is not static. So um, whether you're 10 miles away from a wildfire or 2,000, you can still um, 
experience the effects of it. So whether it's smoke or fire, um, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to understand how to report on this stuff is because just because you're not going to, you're not living in somewhere that's um, specifically in proximity to a wildfire does not mean that your community isn't going to be affected and you're not going to have to report on it. So smoke is also, or wildfire smoke is also international. Um, it's not going to stop at a border station. It, it crosses international borders. So this is something that, that has to be dealt with through maybe international treaties as well. Um, as national policy, it's, it's, it's wildfire smoke can travel thousands of miles, hundreds of miles, and it can affect a community that you would never expect. So like um, New York experienced wildfire smoke from the campfire. So this is, in, this is actually a photo of um, smoke from the campfire. Um, so yeah, um, so in it per, and it can persist after a wildfire event. So in, I believe it's called inversion in valleys of smoke, mm -hmm. can stay like a week after <laughs> the wildfire event and just kind of choke out this entire an entire community it was just it's literally a blanket of wildfire smoke that persists and persists so native americans have been managing north american forests and, and land and prairies and what have you for thousands of years through wildfire they used um ignition so you can see he's igniting a fire right here in the prairie so um they use wildfire and like starting these fires to clear areas of vermin, so like snakes, that type of thing. They used it to create perimeters around communities. They used it to clear areas for, for game hunting, for war too, for for ceremonies. And they had every community had a designated fire, uh, like fire master or fire fire ecologist actually, that would start fires. And they knew that it was necessary to maintain this landscape. White colonizers ostracized them for this practice. They called it Indian fire, and um, they did not understand the science behind it or um, how it was part of managing the, um, the forest. They, they happened upon this continent that um, had abundant game and old growth forests, and they didn't, they didn't understand that it didn't just, it's not statically, it wasn't statically like that. It, it, Native Americans were the, the original forest management. So they were they were ostracized for um, a policy we were now adopting, 150 years later. Really, that's so funny because yeah. I used to have a bumper sticker that said, "Progress is an ancient forest." It's a totally different take. Do you know what I'm saying? That's yeah. Well, but also the those ancient forests were upkept by this. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's progress. Yeah, it is pro yeah, exactly. Um, I think from what they told us, the designated firekeeper would keep they'd have an um, an oyster shell, which didn't make total sense to me. Um, <laughs> um, in the middle of like the American West, um, however, they, uh, there would be communities with oyster shells, but I guess the fire keeper would keep like ignition uh, in their um, in an oyster shell, and only they were allowed to. So it was taken seriously as well. Yeah, and now a lot of traditional like sacred spaces and paths have been covered by trees. These are areas that were normally would experience fire and could be maintained. Um, but without fire, a lot of the spaces in um, the American West that had p been part of their landscape for centuries are now wiped off the map. Um, there's entire like trail systems that now just don't exist because trees have encroached on them. But um, yeah, so finally, I have a video for you guys right. from... Uh, all right, let's see. No, <laughs> wait, sorry. Um, okay, photos, there we go. Okay, so we'll see if this works. It kind of worked when I tried it, so. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I took a trip to the US Forest Service Fire Lab on my last day um, with the um, Institute for Journalism and Natural Resources Wildfire Conference, and I was shown a fire tornado, which can occur Our naturally. It involves uh, firefighter safety and fire world, the fire tornadoes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we'll just describe this apparatus a little bit. So there's no fans or anything going on here. This is all generated by the fire, this rotation. It's a little bit artificial compared to out in the real world, but these things happen in the real world as well at a lot larger scale sometimes. This apparatus, so like Torben said earlier, uh, 
I have I have one last slide. Do you guys have any burning questions? Oh, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one. Yes, Sarah, Lisa? Um, this is completely fascinating. I'm mm. just so sorry that I had this other, other interview and I was like, is there a place for us if we're going to obsess over this now? Because I think mm. we are. Yeah. We just had a broadcast, I think it was two weeks ago, mm. when the wildfire started. Yeah, I think like it was old. April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had like yeah. six, four, five, six stories in a row. Mm -hmm. Right? I just about it. Yeah. The is there a place where we could go and read more about it? Because this is completely fascinating to me. Yeah, I actually believe um, the Institute for um, Journalism and Natural Resources, IJNR, has articles about that um, reflect a lot of the stuff I learned. Not everything. So a lot of this was from um, experts or like scientists that were brought in to speak. So you'll you might have to look for some of that on your own and like in papers. But I could also maybe I could compile a document with a lot of the sources. Um, that would be amazing. So. Yeah, and maybe combine that with the vocabulary sheet so people can access it. So. Have yeah. you talked any at all, Emily, about um, how what they're seeing? I, I mean, are they expecting these trends of things to get drier and hotter? Uh huh. Is it going to keep on that path? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Unless there's um, transformative uh, changes in our society, uh -huh. yeah, it, it's going to continue with climate change. Um, Things are going to get hotter and drier, and droughts are going to be longer. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, actually, is uh, lightning strikes are um, being observed at a lot more. Like they, there's a positive relationship with lightning strikes in um, climate change, so there's going to be more ignitions from um, lightning strikes. Um, yeah, it's a, it can be it, it's a little scary, <laughs> but I mean there are things that we can do concretely. Um, First of all, respond to climate change, but to also manage our forests um, to be less, or to be at least fire resistant and resilient. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I hope you said it's it. like unpredictable where like the, the sparks can go half a mile. Mm -hmm. Have they developed any way to predict at all where a fire is going to go next? Because I know that reporting on that is always the thing is, where is it going to go? Yeah. Like when people are fearful of whether they're going to be next to a, uh, have to evacuate or is it, which direction is it going? Like what are their methods that they're using to determine that? Um, I believe like basically the wind dictates a lot about where these firebrands are going to go. Um, one thing that can be, that was mentioned, um, can be really dangerous is when um, there's a wildfire and there's a storm front coming in and there's just a whole lot of wind that's fanning this fire and, and um, shooting these firebrands off way ahead. Um, so that can be um, a way that uh, wildfire spreads faster because these firebrands are pushed further out and the um the flames are fanned um i i think wind direction but it can be hard to predict things can change like that um so there's a lot of varying factors in uh that go into it so it's hard as a journalist um maybe not maybe not as a scientist to analyze this in real time um but yeah wind direction dictates a lot and of course the environment. So if it's been two weeks from a rain or has it rained yesterday, these things are going to dictate how fast fire can take hold. And if the the fuel is um, flammable, it's going to be flammable. So like a dry tree that just got rained on is going to, even if it's been drying for a hundred years, it's going to be less um, susceptible to a firebrand um, taking hold than a tree that, that has been drying for um, all these years and, and underbrush, that type of thing, that hasn't seen rain in a month. So it really depends on a lot. But yeah. I need to follow that up. I spent November with my mom and her trailer um, outside of Stockton in California. Mm -hmm. Everyone in my family up there, well, down there was sick. Um, mm -hmm. They all had upper respiratory issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, literally looking around the state, there were three wildfires. They were all at least 200 miles away. Uh huh. Right? But my mom's 88, my auntie 91, all my cousins are in their 60s and 70s. Everybody was sick. Like, everybody was sick. Yeah. It's amazing. They couldn't get away from it. Yeah, in the West, the, per the average particulates um, are rising. So in the East, it's actually kind of 
plateaued and in some areas actually um, uh, pollution or these like particulates have, um, there's like less concentration, but in the American West, there's um, higher concentrations of this. And it's, you, it's, you don't have to see smoke to um, have um, particulates uh, laden in the air that can um, cause you to, to become sick. And that's upper respiratory stuff for especially the elderly and babies that can be life-threatening. Well, it seems like as a journalist, uh, like our role is, is to like quell any panic that sets in, where, whereas at the same time also ensuring that people recognize the danger. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of a balance is fi- figuring out how dangerous is it and mm-hmm. how, um, like, how quickly should people be fleeing or, or um, you know, also then preventing rumors from being spread. Um, like you said, with conspiracies and, mm-hmm. um, I mean, how do you, or how do they suggest dealing with that balance or ensuring that we're, that we're keeping an even coverage without, without encouraging panic? Yeah. So one thing that, that was encouraged is, is um, well, actually I heard conflicting things on this. So, um, when you're this kind of, this is a little bit off topic, but um, when you're reporting um, to live stream so people can see what the actual conditions are. And I mean, someone might have their camera trained on a burning bush or a tree, but 20 feet away, it's fine. And so these are things that can kind of cause confusion. So kind of sh- panning around, like showing what the actual environment can be good, but it can also, I mean, someone can go be going through their feet and see their house on fire. So there's kind of these dual, it's kind of hard to um, have a um, like black and white answer to that. Um, Just making sure your science is right and and you're getting it right. Well, I think was something that was um, really stressed. Like if you don't know if if information is correct, talk to a scientist, talk to someone who's involved in this. Don't kind of go with your gut because a lot of the the like uh, prevailing ideas about wildfire um, have been incorrect. Like it, One, I mean, you could, if you didn't know about this stuff, you could think, oh, fire suppression is what should be done. All fire is bad. Well, I mean, that's, that's a logical conclusion to come to in our like society where Smokey the Bear has kind of been telling you that message over and over again. But a lot of the things that we hold to be true aren't true. And that's why um, getting your science right and um, talking to the people who know is really important. Um, That was, that was really stressed. Um, Yeah. And and not in like kind of at least trying to um, represent um, maybe the diversity of um, effect the wildfires um, has on a landscape, no matter. Um, it's hard. I mean, it's it's a hard job as a journalist to do, but um, yeah, it can create panic when an entire area has just a red zone where someone might have family there that maybe they were affected, but maybe they weren't. Um, share Looking for resources from public information officers like uh, burn severity maps was something that was asked of us journalists instead of, uh, or versus just creating graphics on a whim with flames going across it. I mean, there was, it was, it can be kind of flippant. There was one um, TV station that just had flame emojis Mm -hmm. across an entire area, which is just like, yeah, that was one of the biggest asks was please don't do that and don't describe it. The other thing that was asked of us was not to describe it as like in supernatural terms like people have been describing it kind of as a like a dragon it roared down the i mean that can just it it just it doesn't help (laughs) and it creates misconceptions about how wildfire works um and like like i discussed earlier that um conspiracy theories it, it misconceptions lead to people trying to figure things out for themselves which can lead down some wormholes um but yeah Thank you. Thank you guys for coming. It means a lot. Because there's multiple stories right there. There's so many stories here, you guys. Yeah.